Welcome to the Talk BD Podcast. Today, we share the bipolar disorder story of Robert Villanueva. So, Robert Villanueva, welcome to Talk BD. I'm really, really excited to have some time with you today to talk about your experiences of bipolar disorder. But before we get into talking about the condition itself, just tell me a little bit about you as a person. You're from the Bay Area, right? Correct. Yeah. From the San Francisco Bay Area in California there. And first of all, thank you for having me and I appreciate this. And I think we've come a long way in the last two decades. And so I'm happy to be on and sharing my story. And yeah, San Francisco Bay Area. I live across the Bay from San Francisco in Oakland, specifically. I enjoy spending time with my grandkids. So I have two grandkids, nine and 11, and watching them play sports or just, you know, I, I'm, I'm in good enough shape and young enough to go into the bouncy house with them. So I enjoy yeah. that at birthday parties. That's, that's fun. I also was a garbage man as far as a career for 15 years and a, a wrestling coach. So after I get off work, I, I'd be able to go to the high school, local high school and I coached for about 13 years. And I really enjoyed that. Coach V, wasn't that your yeah. your nickname, Coach V? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Coach that. V. It's kind of interesting. I just was part of a ceremony. I became a godparent, but in a na- Native American tradition. And they said, that's my name, my official name now, Coach V. So that's, I think that's kind of neat. So that's some of your varied and wide life outside of the uh, health condition you live with that we're going to be focusing on today, bipolar disorder. But where did that journey begin for you? I think I was 30. I was married. I have a wonderful stepdaughter. Started raising her when she was nine. Happy in my job and coaching and uh, was involved in the community, was a soccer dad and very involved in the school. So at one point, I just started sleeping too much. I felt like I couldn't get out of bed. I would call it the flu. It usually would last a couple of days, but I still had to go to work. I still had to be enthusiastic at, at, at practice, but just didn't feel it. it that emotion, it didn't feel fun. It didn't feel that motivating to me. That's when I thought something's not right. It just, the sleep, I started missing work. I started calling in sick to work, which was not normal for me. I just had kind of a brain fog, kind of described it as jet lag to where I just couldn't shake it off and I just felt off. And then day-to-day activities were tough, paying bills. It became after probably about a year, just paying bills was difficult. And, you know, we had plenty of money in the bank. But actually writing a check or just getting my um, cognitive awareness to actually write a check, look at the bill, mail it, send it off. It just seemed so much, you know? And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, it was difficult. It was unbelievable. The phones got cut off at one point. And my wife, that's when she found out that I was really struggling and didn't know what was going on. And so we reached out for help with my general practitioner, my family doctor, he sent me to a psychiatrist and I was diagnosed with clinical depression. So we treated that for a couple of years with medication and a therapist. I didn't report when I felt good and could sleep four hours and go, 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 be the most motivated coach in the gym. And, oh, you um, mean you were knocking on your GP's door at the time saying, hey, hey, bud, I'm feeling pretty good right now. So like, I'd let you know that that wasn't happening. No, that wasn't, you know, I I wasn't reporting that part of it. I wasn't reporting the part where I woke up one morning and decided we need a convertible car and went to a car lot and purchased a convertible little car. And then a week later, why did I buy a car, you know, and I paid top price for it. And so these impulsive things, Mm -hmm. which I thought was really cool and really neat and justified it. And, but Looking at the bank account, that's when you could see it chipping away, chipping away, chipping away to the point where we started having financial troubles. Um, Yeah. And then, wow, it was a world of, I was lost. I I didn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. My life started falling apart. I couldn't follow through in tasks. 
And I started kind of lying why I wasn't following with tasks, whether it was coaching or, you know, working with the kids or garbage company or other responsibilities. I started isolating. Just circle back for a moment for me there. Why, why were you lying? Um, just tell me a little bit more about what was going on for you at that point. Yeah, because I always volunteered for responsibilities. Mm-hmm. So I was always there and dependable and, you know, for 10 years and in that particular community I was living in. And I would say, okay, well, I, I purchased a wrestling mat. They gave me money for it, but I never actually ordered it because I couldn't mm-hmm. make decisions of what I wanted or contact mm-hmm. people. And I actually said, yes, yeah, I ordered it thinking, okay, I'll do it tomorrow. And, mm-hmm. and it was very confusing to me because how can I not follow through? Mm-hmm. That is just not my normal self that I know. So kind of life started falling apart. I ended up selling my house. And then moving into an apartment, my wife and I weren't getting along very well just because of that, that lack of responsibility and she didn't understand it. I didn't understand it. I was going to therapy. I thought there was a magic pill or a silver bullet that was supposed to be fixing me. Mm. So I ended up leaving before we disliked each other too much. We were really focused on my daughter and she was 18 and that wasn't in question, the relationship with my daughter and responsibility with my daughter, but it was with our relationship and, and the direction we were headed. So um, I feel blessed on that, that we did focus on my daughter and mm-hmm. make sure that we always got along and were friendly to each other. But I, I, I didn't understand what I was dealing with and how could she understand what? I was dealing with. So I ended up moving out and it got to the point where I couldn't understand what was going on. I really was battling with suicidal thoughts. Mm-hmm. I was starting to drink, drink more to fall asleep. I was withdrawing and seeing people at all, hiding from people, literally. By then, we had hired another coach to be a head coach, as an assistant coach. So I did try to take care of the people around me, but I had my own secret. You know, nobody knew why. I remember one time I I went to practice, and it was practice time, and I looked in the window, and I didn't want to be seen, but the team captain, he looked up and he saw me in the window, and I just couldn't go in. I left. Mm. And that was, that was a horrible moment for me. Mm-hmm. And then the suicidal thoughts got, you know, more, stronger and stronger to the point where I felt I had no choice. You know, it wasn't a decision I was making. I just didn't have a choice. I couldn't live like this. My brain was broken. So mm-hmm. I didn't make one more appointment with my general practitioner at the time. I think it was a cry for help, letting him know that. I was going to end my life. I did have a plan how to end my life. And if I didn't get help in that moment, Mm -hmm. then that's what I was going to do. So he, Mm -hmm. he was shocked. How quickly did you get that appointment, Robert, when you, you know, because I know that sometimes, particularly with bipolar disorder, the symptoms can change quite quickly that there's sometimes a short window of opportunity. It was going to be two days. Mm-hmm. until I can mm-hmm. see him. And so for two days, I pretty much locked myself in my room and knew that I couldn't go out of my room. Otherwise, I may follow through with my wow. plan. Um, so wow. I had made this promise to myself to at least do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I got up, took a shower. I probably looked like I am now. My hair wasn't so gray. It was a little blacker. And went into my doctor's office and I looked like I was ready to, you know, my regular day. And he asked me, you know, questions and asked me if I had a firearm. I said, no, I would have used it already. And that kind of shocked him. But he did a good job. You know, we kind of turned the lights down low and then ended up letting me sit in his office, called the hospital, local hospital, and had me drive to the hospital as opposed to an ambulance. 
I think that was a good choice now. Back then, I thought, well, he's just trying to save money. Insurance is trying to save money. But I, I guess I do appreciate it now that I know more about the mental health system. I know here in California, there's 5150, which is a mandatory hold, 72 hours, I believe. So I was able to go to the hospital and for two days, I didn't talk to anybody because I didn't belong there. And it wasn't a dangerous place. There's food, there's meals. I got sleep medication. I was able to sleep. And then I started interacting with other patients. I saw that the other patients were taking care of the individuals that were less functional, I guess, like meals and whatnot. They would cut up their steaks and then. You know, there's some people in psychosis and others would kind of nurse them along and, and take care of each other, which, which I found pretty amazing. So I opened up to start opening up more and realizing for me, it was the first time that I was ever taken care of, even as a child, teenager, you know, adult. I didn't have to cook. I didn't have to shop. I could just work on myself and my situation and really find out what was going on. So it became a safe place for me. We should pause on that for a second because that's such a powerful thing. This was one of the first times in your life where you were being looked after and taken care of. Yeah. And you've already described, you know, I can imagine through coaching, even, even through your work as a, you know, a garbage collector and, you know, working with that team of people, it seems like you've done a lot of, a lot of giving and a lot of caring yourself in those early parts of your life. And then it's almost ironic that you come to this point where you finally were like, oh, I need help and I'm going to accept that. Yeah, it was, I was, it was amazing. You know, there's people to help me. And he said, I never had that before where it's Mm kind of like, take your time. It wasn't a rush. It's like, let's just get you back on your feet. And I have not had that before. So the focus was on me and how do we get me stabilized and how do we get me prepared to come out of hospital and take the next steps to take care of myself and learn how to self-care, which is a 30-year-old Hispanic male in, you know, a very, we call it machismo community. Mm-hmm. That's hard. You know, the hardest moment in the hospital was that I did not tell anybody when I checked into the hospital. And it was about the third or fourth day that I decided, you know, then I started getting instability, more sleep, and I had to call my family and let them know where I was and friends. I'm, I'm sure they were worried. Oh, you hadn't told your family where you were either at that point, no? No, no. Wow. It was, it's shameful. How, how could I be in a psychiatric hospital? You know, I'll lose my coaching for sure. You know, I may lose my job. I, you know, I knew all the stigma that came along with that. Stigma that I, I was stigmatizing to others, you know, prior to, you know, I would have the same thoughts of, you know, you're, you're weak, just, just, you know, pull up your bootstraps. So I called, I called my house or my wife about the third or fourth day and told her what was going on, that I was in the hospital, that I was suicidal and I wanted to uh, check out or end my life. I said, you know, can you tell Jessica and can you guys bring me some clothes and, you know, come visit? I would love to see you. And she said, no, I'm not going to tell her. You tell her. Mm. And I, I, I was in this phone booth. And back in the day when we had quarters, had put another quarter in. She got on the phone. Robert, what are you doing? Where have you been? And, and I had explained it to her because I thought we had always been honest with each other. And I'd always preach honesty. And. I told her I was in the psychiatric hospital and I wanted to, that I couldn't, I didn't want to live anymore. And I was confused Mm -hmm. and she cried and I cried and it was hard, but it was honest. It was the truth, Mm -hmm. you know, and so I asked to come see me and, you know, so the next day they came in and my daughter 
She brought balloons, <laughs> yeah. she brought a couple magazines. She brought my favorite candy, malted milk balls, yeah. the round chocolate ones. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. good choice. Yeah. <laughs> and she brought me the big, big box. So, well, yeah, because I don't think she really knew what the hospital setting was. And to her, you know, there was no stigma. She just knew that I was in the hospital. And then, mm-hmm. you know, I, I needed to get better or I was unhealthy or, you know, so she didn't know about it, I guess, looking back. So I think that's a, a unique story of my daughter, Jessica. Yeah. So showing up. Some of this I haven't thought about in a while. So thank you for giving me a chance to have those memories. Well, I can see by the smile on your face how, how, meaningful and important Mm -hmm. that visit was and the way Mm -hmm. that that went so many years ago, even at this point of your life. Mm -hmm. One of the other things at the hospital was a social worker. Probably on the fourth day, he started talking about mania, which is high energy and lack of sleep. And and I hadn't heard of that before. And I was like, you you still don't have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder at this point in the hospital. No, it was about the fourth day. Oh, really? Interesting. Okay. Yeah, about the fourth day. And he started to whiteboard within one of our our groups, the group sessions. And he made a little wave of depression. So, yeah, okay, I understand that, but it's not quite me. And then he starts going above the normal line. I guess we'll call it normal line, stability line. I like, like to use the word stability. He started going up and he said, okay, uh, people start talking faster. They get a bunch of ideas and, you know, I'm like, wow, I got poetry hidden in the closet because I saw a movie about poetry and I thought I'd be a great poet <laughs> with no background of poetry at all. And then he started going higher and it's like more lack of sleep and no sleep. And what I mean by no sleep is that I'd be in bed and I'd sleep, fall asleep at wake up every 15 minutes looking at the clock and just battle it for Mm -hmm. four hours and then get out Mm -hmm. of bed. I remember at one point I got out of bed and just got in fetal position and just wanted to slow my head down. My thoughts, they were just spinning so fast. So this was eye-opening for me. He gave me a book and in the book, I heard these symptoms and stories of people that were dealing with that part of Mm -hmm. hypomania. Uh, mm-hmm. And like a light went off, I said, I want to learn more. Um, mm-hmm. So when I got out of the hospital, I definitely sought out more information. So I'd spend about eight to nine hours in our local bookstore, huge bookstore. And they have comfortable couches and coffee shop in there. So I went in and read every story on the shelf about personal stories, living with bipolar disorder, you know, I, I still read like this because I don't want to fold the pages because I didn't buy it. And I put them back on the shelf, <laughs> uh, habit I have. And then I started reading about neurochemistry and psychology and philosophy and, you know, spent that year, got educated. And it was a safe place for me once again, you know, dependable, I can go there. And read the current stories and research. And that was part of my acceptance. In another instant, I was in peer support groups. And one of the people in the peer support group mentioned that they're out of work for a month and they had to go back to the office. And she was terrified. Wonderful lady, so kind, so nice. And she was terrified that someone would find out she had bipolar disorder. To the point where she was in tears and, you know, this was on a Friday. She had to go to work on Monday. Other people were telling her within the peer group, you know, don't say anything, you know. And she's like, well, you know, and she was just struggling. And there was a moment where I I couldn't imagine her going to work every day and someone with the fear of someone discovering that she's diagnosed with a mental health you know, has a mental health diagnosis. So I think that's when I said, if, if I have a chance to tell my story and, and that I will, I won't back down from that because I don't want to live in fear. I don't want to live in that same fear. Mm-hmm. So I think it, anytime I speak, it strengthens, continues to strengthen me and feeling confident in myself, kind of who I am. Mm-hmm. 
Do you think that's particularly important for you as a guy as well to be relaying your story? Absolutely. I think that's why I really emphasize, and thank you for letting me emphasize, the part of being a garbage man and uh, a, you know, a labor guy, uh, quote unquote, uneducated, you know, right out of high school working, hadn't been to college or university. Yeah. And also a coach, you know, someone in the community that works with kids and, you know, is a mentor. And so I think that's a really important part of my story because a lot of those sto- books and stories I read it was written by either academics or people that had been in college right. that, you know, but not a lot about written from someone like myself with the point of view of, you know, just struggling to make ends meet, much right. less uh, dealing with the mental health order. So. I do think being a male, and I still find that maybe 15% of advocates are male. So Mm -hmm. I do think that is important. It's amazing, isn't it? You remind me of, I remember being at a a conference once in Canada about 15 15 or 20 years ago, and I gave a talk on bipolar disorder. It was all physicians. It was a a, a GP, a family doctor's conference. And at the end of my talk, a woman came up to me and she's crying, and she's a GP, family, family doctor. And she says, I've never told anybody that I live with bipolar disorder. There's 25 years of living with the condition other than the person that was prescribing her her medication. She never told a single soul because of fear of stigma. Are you still involved in support groups at this point? Or where is most of your advocacy work at this point? So I think in my journey as I've evolved in my journey with bipolar disorder, I got an opportunity to do presentations in my local community, did pretty good at that. And so then I got invitations around the state from different organizations. I was working with uh, National Alliance on Mental Illness, which is NAMI. NAMI, yeah. And I got in a program where I could train other people to share their stories and ended up working across the nation and training other trainers to go back to their states. That gave me an opportunity to work with Stephen Hinshaw over at University of California, Mm -hmm. Berkeley, who allowed me to come into Berkeley and be part of a research program. I did have to volunteer for two years and work Mm -hmm. with grad students. So, you know, I had to earn my way in, but I kind of came in the back door, we call it. And so he helped me be part of a research of a high school program that we did some work on. And then later with a Fulbright scholar from the UK, yeah, I really want to thank Mary O'Harris. She um, opened up a lot of doors for me and we hit it off. So I get, got invited to the UK to do some work with her and speak at different universities and pretty cool stuff, pretty neat stuff. Nice. And then now I'm back on a research program at Cal with Sherry Johnson. Mm-hmm. Who is a very kind person and I've spoke to her class over the last 10 years, her site class, and I like to do interactive presentations. So I don't lecture, really don't call it a lecture or have slides. Normally it's, I share part of my story, kind of like this format right here. Mm -hmm. And then take questions from the, uh, the audience or the students and it opens dialogue and we get different questions depending Mm -hmm. on the class. And some people share that they have a mental health diagnosis for the first time or, mm-hmm. you know, or their mom or their brother or their mm-hmm. best friend. Do other people help you at this point to detect those moments when things are starting to slip a bit? Yeah, I've built, yeah. for me, healthy friends that recognize or I can go to and say, I'm having these difficulties. I would have to say something that I was amazed by is my wife. So I've been married five years. Basically, I was going into hypomania and hadn't really slept for a couple of days and had a project in the backyard. And and she saw that I was getting kind of agitated. And so she said, well, what do you do when you start getting hypomanic? And it's like, I take a benzodiazepine and, and sit down for a while. So we did that. Still couldn't sleep really that night. So, you know, fortunate enough to go away and sit by a pool and, you know, get a hotel room. And that night I slept maybe two hours. And um, the next day we laid by the pool and just enjoyed ourselves. Once again, got about four hours sleep. I mean, this is incredible. Had some antipsychotics. And then 
a day later, I so started getting back to myself and got some sleep, you know. About a month later, I talked to my general practitioner and he's like, well, yeah, you went through a manic episode. I'm like, well, I don't think it was a manic episode. And they started going down the list and I'm like, but, and it shocked me. He said, the difference mm -hmm. is it wasn't a destructive manic episode because you mm -hmm. had support. You had backup plans. You went through your coping skills and there wasn't mm -hmm. the destruction that could have been. That used to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was, even though I've had bipolar disorder for 20 years plus, I was big. I was really big. What would you tell your younger self could go back in time? Why don't we go back to, what, 25? Would that be a reasonable time yeah. to go back to? 20? The 20 year old self? <laughs> what would you tell yourself at that point? Yeah, 2025. Well, my grandmother used to always tell me, mijo, which is endearing, you know, Mexican saying. You always know what the right thing is. The right thing isn't always the easiest thing, but you know it's the right thing, you yeah. know, and you have a choice. Clearly, you haven't been walking this journey alone either. Is there anybody in particular that you would mention at this point or that jumps out to your mind that you wanted to mention? I do. My general practitioner, Dr. Jonathan B. Humphrey. We've been working together for 20 years, and it's amazing that he's a general practitioner and he focuses on bipolar disorder. And I truly believe without the collaboration with him, and I'm able to be honest, I wouldn't be as stable in where I'm at now. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. University of California, Berkeley. I mean, they really set a tone of, of acceptance, I believe. 25% of their students are transfer students from community colleges. And I think the programs they have of diversity really just, I mean, it gave me the opportunity to, to be a part of the university and do research. And, Remember the first research the dyad I ran, it was over with and I practiced for months and I was nervous and I finished it up and I was walking down the street and I called my daughter. I mean, life couldn't get any better unless I called you and told you because I always, you know, encourage her with education and here I am, you know, 40 years old and, and being part of a, a program at Cal. So... You know, that, that I love, I love her to death. Uh, Dr. Stephen Hinshaw, who I mentioned. I adore that guy. <laughs> oh my, no. The way he embraced me. I mean, I had to work with his grad students. He invited me to work with grad students. We met at a, at a seminar. We were both speaking. The patients he had and to see him work in the community mm -hmm. and volunteer his time to go to small meetings of parents and you know, and he's such a busy person and author and sharing his story and his dad lived in the Florida soil. Was he wrote a couple of wonderful books and we'll drop those into the show notes. The first one of his I, I read was it was it The Mark of Shame about stigma? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's an excellent Marcus, read. Yeah. 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 And it's I'm blanking on it, but it is right there. Another kind of madness. Thank uh, you. And it's about his his story of growing up with his father and learning and the choices he made and he um, actually gave me a little credit in there. So that was, that was <laughs> nice. We've become very good friends, I would say over time. And definitely he's a mentor. Um, my wife of five years, you know, that was an example of her supporting me and understanding. She works in with the, within the mental health community and actually Professor Hinshaw introduced us. Hmm. So <laughs> yeah, she's, She's been supportive and through the grandiose thinking, through the depression, through the, you know, as I mentioned, manic episodes. And mm, my grandkids, I love watching them play ball. And, you know, there's such, it's right now, just to think about them, big hugs and everything. And my daughter and her husband, Patrick, <laughs> they're just really good people in the community. And I, I couldn't be prouder of them. So. Oh, Robert, that was a wonderful, 
wonderful conversation. Thank you for being so open and honest and authentic and just really r- real. Yeah, I appreciate that. And this is a great format. And thank you and Kate and everybody involved in putting this together. Thanks. Thanks so much for your time. Take care and I'll see you again soon. All right. Thank you. But they believed in me. They said, you can do this. And I had $32 in my bank account. I was living in the back room of my friend's house for free. My first presentation in front of seven people in Concord. And now it's grown to this, speaking in front of 3,000 people. And I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to all those pioneers before me that paved the way. The parents, the brothers, the advocates, the psychiatrists, the psychologists. God bless you. God bless the United States of America.